so everyone can get the benefits from each of the programs. So we've got uh, topics on content, search, uh, user experience, analytics, video, and so forth. So hopefully you can apply and find some relevance to each of the presentations in your field. So before I go into my presentation, I just want to personally thank each of you for attending. Um, it's quite amazing. Not even half the attendees here are from Southern California, uh, which is pretty amazing with all the events that are here locally in Los Angeles. We have uh, a lot coming uh, interstate from across the states, and we have uh, five international attendees as well from uh, five countries, Australia, Canada, Japan, Austria, and Ukraine, which is it's, a, it's awesome. So I've gradually been trying to get around to each of you to, to say hi. So on behalf of all the locals here in SoCal, those that have come interstate, and those international, and all the travel arrangements and effort to get here, let's give everybody a warm welcome. <laughs> so who here likes entrepreneurial stories? To see the paths that other people have, have walked. Now I'm not talking about those unbelievable stories that you might hear in the media, media from time to time. You know, young uh, Silicon Valley tech startup, six months old, no revenue stream, no business model, but it's been valued at billions of dollars and it's acquired for hundreds of millions and, and, and flipped in less than a year. I, I don't know about you, but I can't personally relate to these, these kind of stories when you hear them, and I, I can't, certainly can't relate to them. Now, while we're here at the, the conference, we're going to meet different types of characters, and everyone has their own story to share. But uh, I would like to speak to you about my reality. And it's my own story, and in a term in my home country, might, we might call an Aussie battler. So why did I decide to put on this Digimarcon conference series anyway in the first place? Good question. My background is not in event producing. I've never done this before. Um, I don't typically even attend these types of conferences. It just goes back to a business need. So let's consider reality. Uh, there's a well-known super graphic that marketers in the space would likely have seen before. It's released on an annual basis the last four to five years by uh, chiefmartech.com. And this is what the first slide, uh, what it looked like back in August 2011. And what it is, it just kind of summarized, puts into categories, just a spread of kind of the companies in the space. And in each of the categories, you'll notice that there's, there's a handful of brands at the time. So when it started, there was 250 companies. And uh, yeah, it's, for now, I mean, we've got a, a massive screen here today. Maybe at the back, maybe even having trouble seeing some of those logos at, at this size. When it was next released, is, and I'm kind of showing you the evolution of how products have been ramping up in the previous few years. This is how it looked at September 2012. It jumped to, um, to 350 companies, so 100 companies increase across 45 different categories. So it's starting to get a little bit crazy up there. All the interweaving, they, they changed their design a bit. Let's move ahead, January 2014. Look what's happened. It's, it's pretty crazy. It, went, it, it ballooned to 947 companies, tripled in one year. And uh, again, in 43 categories under six major classes. I mean, I'm up here, I'm up close, and I, look, I, I get, my eyesight's pretty good, but I'm, I'm struggling here. But it doesn't end there, that was last year. What happened this year? Oh my goodness. It, it doubled again. 1,876 companies were on uh, uh, the, the map this time. It's, it's staggering. Uh, the, the logos are so small you can't even see it anymore. Uh, how do you feel when you see this? When you see it as marketers or as vendors? What's, what's the reaction here? Well, as, as marketers, we've never had it so good, right? We're, we're like, look how much choice we have here. It more becomes about pick and choose, try out. It's like making a choice within your category and drilling down, and it's just, it's, it's overwhelming, but there's plenty of competition there in the spaces. But I know from a vendor perspective, perspective with, a, with a tech uh, marketing solution, I don't feel so good when I see this. I don't think 
Oh my goodness, look at all the successful companies in each of the categories. There's a lot of opportunity there uh, in uh, ser marketing search products. Now, if anything, it's, it's the opposite. It's like, oh my goodness, wh what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I coming into this space with a product with this saturated market, too much competition, and too many cat uh, brands in each of those boxes? Where's there room to innovate in this clutter here? The, the reality is, as as whelming as that super graphic is, it's impressive each year, and who knows what it's going to look like next year if they keep doing it. But it's not even a true representation of the available solutions out there in the marketplace. The fact of it is, is the tip of the iceberg. The media portrays kind of a bit of a warp perspective, and we really only hear about the, the real successes, those that really dominate in the space, which is just a, a tiny fraction of everybody else, because a lot of vendors are left in the long tail that we never even find out about, learn about these brands. But they're there. Each of them have different uh, entrepreneurs or, or founders steering that business, different funding models, and uh, different stories as well. <laughs> So I'm going to briefly tell you about my story in 2010. I pioneered a new technology. I formed a new company called Search Experiences. Bootstrapped and self-funded, I worked within, within my means. I spent the next two and a half years in R&D, building up the business, setting up regional offices, uh, setting up the, the web team so it could scale when knowing if you're a first mover in the market you don't want to be the bottleneck that you have to when you get the, in, the injection of early clients knowing that the when the competitors get a sniff of what you're doing and code around your patents um, you've only got a short jump to market so I had to get systems in place for scalability uh, for, for the rapid rollout so with a, with a strong value proposition I started knocking on doors and initiated discussions with prospective uh, clients in different brands. With the new technology though, if there's no comparables in the market, it's kind of difficult when you're the first because they can't really, there's an you have to sit down face to pay, face, train uh, the user. How do you know the benefit of tweeting before Twitter? You know, how do you know the value of having a Facebook fan page before Facebook? This kind of uh, first mover problem. So the difference was between my business and the companies we saw in that previous marketing graphic is they're, they're mainly for small businesses where they have a freemium model, it's low cost, it's generally under $100 to, to use, it's a monthly recurring model. It's, it's scaled, they're based on having thousands of businesses on board. So it really lends itself to quick try before you buy and it's really low, low risk and easy entry. So, but with my solution, what I was building was a different model. It was more towards medium to large size companies. And it was not suitable for small businesses. It was costly. There was a custom build per engagement. Um, it, was, um, it was for companies that had a large consumer reach. I soon realized that this was an enterprise complex sale with a, with a long sales cycle. This is because uh, the decision making was so fragmented, there were so many influences involved with the decision making pro process. If you work for a large company, maybe you can relate to some of the issues uh, I saw. There was multiple departments involved, marketing, branding, IT, legal, there would have been agency involved. And it's hard to get all those influences together when you're, you know, you're face to face with the CMO who you feel is the key decision maker, but there's everyone else you, you never know about this, the sphere behind them that guides them. That was one issue. Sometimes it becomes political internally. You'd have the IT department who don't want more work, so they don't like marketing suggesting a new solution that marketing loves it, but IT feels, oh, this is going to give us more work. And, and so it's, um, there's resistance that way. And the other angle with the, from the IT side is they like to be the clever ones. They don't like marketing showing them something. They want to be the ones bringing new technologies to the table and recommendations. And with large companies, inadvertently, there was a, a third party media agency involved. And when it came to search, agencies have other priorities. 
especially they're retained on a percentage of search spend uh, that affects their bottom line. It's not in their best interest to recommend low-cost alternative solutions to the brands that they represent. So after some significant brands uh, strung me along uh, and didn't, didn't follow through, um, I knew there was a call to, call to action problem. Uh, and the person I was presenting to, not too innovative as well. They're more conservative followers, wait for other people to be first movers in the market and quickly follow them. Not driven to be, I want to be first and take the credit and move with a new product. So how to stand out? When they're bombarded with pitches left, right and centre for different products, how can you break through? So then the idea came to me, instead of me going to the people, why don't I do something a bit unusual and or unorthodox? There were digital marketing professionals that I was approaching and part of their ongoing learning was to attend conferences. So how about I organise a digital marketing conference, host the event and then they could come to me. I needed a name. So Digital Marketing Conference, Digimark on, minute later, yep, that sounds like a, co a conference, that'll work. And Digimark on was born. I did some research and there was many huge mature conferences in the space, really impressive, like South by Southwest, AdTech, Summit, iStrategy. I was coming into a very uh, tough uh, field in the event space. It's, but it seemed that the success of a conference was based on a handful of factors. It was the speakers, it was the content, uh, it was the location and timing, uh, pricing, and I felt uh, the, the location and the venue itself. Uh, I felt I could kind of rival on content on the program, the speakers, the timing and the pricing, but I felt it was the, the location and the venue where I could di differentiate. So if I was going to go to the tent, the a conference, not that I had been previously, where would, I, where would it be appealing for me to go? Well, as an Aussie, I start thinking about the beach. So, uh, and I think about, you know, tropical paradise, and I thought about the Caribbean. Great, okay, so the Digimarkan conference can be on a cruise ship sailing the Caribbean. That sounds like a nice idea. So I jumped in, I started planning the, the first conference on a cruise ship. I had a contract with Carnival Cruise Lines initially. They had a conference centre on board with a capacity of a couple hundred people in their meeting space. I had a contract for 200 cabins. Uh, and this, this was in yep, September 2013. I thought I'd put, I'd put a great site together, get the word out. Well, the registrations would come. Who would want to go on a cruise around the Caribbean for a week and, and have, mix a conference with the, all the networking? So I signed the contract in December. And three months later, the, the, the cruise was going to be in June. Six, so I had six months window. In March, I was kind of halfway time. How was I going? I was ready for a major milestone uh, payment for the cabins. And at the time of all the promoting, I didn't get the, the limit I needed at that stage. Because I was liable for around $200,000 if I didn't fill those cabins myself, if they were empty. So I backed out. I decided I, I, it was min minimal um, kind of um, um, penalty if I exited the contract early. So I took that role. So I'd been spending six months planning the event with this theory of the cruise, digital marketing conference cruise. What am I going to do? Uh, walk away and say, look, it was a good idea, but it's a, it's a bit too tough, um, and move on. Or I could uh, try again. So I'm a, I'm a stubborn entrepreneur. I just want to get it done. I'd spend that time. Let's just do these conferences. So I pushed it a year forward, knowing that I needed more time. I got a new contract with Royal Caribbean. Um, I wanted to, if I was going to do the event again, I want a West Coast location. So I was looking for a suitable location here. And it seemed a lot of the marketing conferences are either San Diego or up in San Francisco. So I felt, hey, Silicon Beach, Santa Monica, why don't I bring it right here? There's a thriving tech hub uh, here in Los Angeles. So a year later, here we are. Uh, last month, we had the inaugural Digimark on Cruise 2015. Uh, it was a, a week cruising around the Caribbean and it was fantastic. Do you want to see some pics? Yeah. Now, 
now, if I wasn't so anti-social media, it would be very easy for me to load up in one click an Instagram splash page with all the photos showing off, look at me, but I didn't. So I had to this morning find some photos, copy and paste them into a slide. So yeah, well, I went a bit old school this morning. So yeah, it was a seven night cruise and uh, you'll see some, uh, you know, some, some faces that you see here today. We had Jacob there, uh, Lisa, um, one of the other speakers you'll say, see later this morning. We had Mark Schaefer there, our, our closer today, who also did the workshop yesterday. It was a little cute event. Uh, we went to Haiti, Jamaica, Caymans and Cozumel, it did the loop and it was great. There was, some, there was a couple of days at sea, we did the sessions and we, we did the inaugural. So let's move back to our technology, which, oh yeah, Kung Fu Panda was there as well. Let's bring back to the technology why I wanted to put these events on in the first place. What is search experiences that I want to uh, launch these events as I, well, have these events as a launch pad? So when I was, uh, I was fascinated in search, having been in the field for five years, um, and in, in 2010 I'm looking for how to, uh, I believe that's it. What are the opportunities to innovate in space? Uh, the search space is dominated by these three companies. We have obviously Google, we have Microsoft with the Bing product, and we have Yahoo, they just, which get the leftovers. So what I was more looking for, what, what are they doing, what aren't they doing, how can I do something new without going head to head against the 8,000 pound gorillas here? So. The first observation I saw is that these search engines have content controlled results. And what I mean by that is when you're within a search engine, uh, you have different categories of search results. You, ha you have web results, obviously, is the main one. You have image results, video, shopping, maps. There's a whole spread. And these search engines, it, you didn't have a choice. They were either them, them, or them. When I'm in the Bing experience, it's Bing web results, Bing shopping, Bing images. So they are directing or guiding or, you could say, controlling those results. So the opportunity then, thinking about Web 3.0, is how can we have unbiased results that are user-driven, uh, user-customized? So companies lead for different search categories. When I think of a shopping site, I want to search for something in shopping field. Do we think of Yahoo shopping search? No, no we don't. Do we, do we think of Bing shopping? No, we think of Amazon. We think of eBay. These guys lead in the space for shopping. When I think of a reference site, an encyclopedia, well, we go to Wiki, don't we, to find as our resource. So what if there was a search platform where I, as a user, could customise and I take ownership of where I'm getting my feed to my own preferences. We're all individuals, aren't we? We've all got different sites that we like to use. Instead of going to 10 different sites, why couldn't I set my own search platform to the, the providers that I like? That's the first opportunity. The second opportunity was the experience itself. If you think of those search engines, they're mass market. They're a tool that everybody can use. So the experience that you have and myself is essentially the same. We have a, a white skin you know, background. We may be able to change the wallpaper if, if we want. Um, the, the results are bland. It's more a one-size-fits-all. So the opportunity then is, why does it have to be that way? Why couldn't I have uh, in the search engine, the number one activity I do every single day, why couldn't it be themed around my passion point, something I'm personally interested in as an individual? I don't care going to my homepage to search every day and see it's celebrating the 150th birthday of whoever. I can't relate to that. That's not part of my world. So that was the second uh, opportunity to create a branded experience around my interest. So what's the point of it? So that's essentially what Search Experiences is. It's a branded search platform or a theme search engine where the user gets to uh, customise the search results based on their preference and then it's themed with their, p with their interests. So on the, so. At the moment, let's see at the moment without the, uh, a branded search, the normal behaviour. Traffic normally comes to a site in two ways, directly or indirectly. I don't know how, how, <laughs> how thirsty we are this, this time of the morning, but I'm using Heineken as an example here this morning. So 
if I'm going to go to their website directly, I go to Heineken.com, if I put in the URL in my browser, but what is the main way? The main way we're going to, we'll go to Google, go up in our browser and type H-E-I-N and find the result and click the search result first and then visit the website indirectly. If the search engine you're using was themed around the, the, the brand, it, oh, and think about it, searching for your website, how, how many times are you searching for your website compared to everything else you're searching for? It's a tiny fraction, it wouldn't even be 1% of all the sites you're going to be searching for. If you're theming the engine itself, it doesn't matter what you're searching for, you're there on every page. <laughs> I'll show you some different features of branded search, just how to get your header around it, or you know, how it's different to the regular search engines you use, for, uh, use at the moment. So we have a... Uh, a changeable, switchable background skin. We've got the regular search bar through the middle. We have a drop down uh, select near the search uh, button where you can change your provider. If you're a Yahoo user, I'll change the drop down to Yahoo and you'll remember that next time I come back. I don't have to set it. I have a co branded logo around the brand, and then underneath is a dynamic uh, custom content area. So it's some, well, it's some social, some, some tweets, or something that's dynamic that's going to change each time I come back to the, to the site. Once I perform a search query, I'm then taken to the regular search results. Now think about what you normally see on a search result page. And uh, I'm, I'm using an example here of a, a, a brand. Uh, but it could be, for instance, uh, the, you, you may be into your NBA and you're a big LeBron and Cavs fan. So this could be a, a Cavaliers, a Cavs search experience themed around your favourite sports team, as an example. I'm just using this, this brand. So we have the regular search results. And on the right, what do we normally have on the right side? It's, it's often the, um, the ads. The, the paid ads or the ad sense that we generally ignore, which are never, someone paying the premium to interfere with our organic results is never going to be as good as the organic result. So we uh, take out the ad free feed so it doesn't have the ads, free up a sidebar of custom content for the brand as well. To the, so you can have a sidebar. So if you're a tech junkie, um, you know this could be an LA Times experience where you've got up to the moment breaking news. So it's combining two activities, a site you like going to with this activity you're going to do anyway, and it's quite, um, it's the uh, it will drive you push and pull back towards their official site. So it's, it's, it sits outside the site. The brand has their official social profiles. Their search engine may be on its own domain, heinekensearch.com, as an example. But people search in different ways. So we need some other tools uh, of how people can activate this platform. So there's a browser toolbar. Everyone's used these for a long time. We don't use it personally because we're in tech, but if we've ever logged into our parents' computer, You've seen them pre-installing all this rubbish into their browser, these toolbars that, you know, it gets onto a lot uh, of PCs. So we provide a browser toolbar. As a, can, this can be a free download from their site. A web widget. So at every website, you've got the, the regular site search. We can change that and put a web-enabled web search widget embedded in the site. Online awareness, how do we know, get awareness that we have the search engine? Well, it's, it's very segmented. If, if you're not a Lakers fan, you're not going to use a Lakers search engine. But if you're a season ticket holder, you live in LA, you go to Staples, you live and breathe your team, then you're following in Twitter, aren't you? You're following them in Facebook. So the brand, Lakers say, hey, check out Lakers search. They give the uh, awareness. The, the most passionate users decide if they're going to uh, try it or use it or not. So another benefit that uh, every brand can use from this is for any website is you don't even need to know that a company has a search engine. And I'm not saying in, in the instance of Heineken that, that you're going to stop using Google, Yahoo, or Bing, your daily search engine, start using Heineken as your daily search engine. You don't even know that they have a search engine. But through your normal behavior, you can activate this. And, um, and this is something that's valuable for most brands. The web search widget that you normally see in a site search, think about it, every visitor to your website, there's, there's something every one of them will do. Everyone will exit. 
at some time, whether they're there for a few minutes and 10 page views, or you've paid to get them there for a, you know, a couple of page views, they're there for 30 seconds, they're going to jump off and leave. So where are they going next? They're going back to a search engine to search the, the next website, aren't they? It's the, we, our behavior is search engine, website, search engine, website, zigzag, zigzag. If there's a search bar within the page we're already in, then some people will just use the search bar that's right there. So when they leave, if they use your web-enabled search bar, they're going to activate your branded search results and you can extend the time they're engaging your brand. So uh, as, as an example, if, if you're a bank, You've, you've used paid search to drive them to your site in the first place. They're doing a financial search query and they're, shop, they're shopping around. There's many banks. They're going to leave next and search for your competitor. So when they leave, you can stay with them a little bit longer. A few more page views, another 30 seconds. Have an experience and do something experiential with your, with your brand. So looking ahead, uh, the technology is young. But there's a huge opportunity for many companies to embrace branded search. Uh, we have different examples there across industry, whether it be entertainment or video or sports, universities, any, any business that has, uses Wi-Fi, restaurants, hotels, uh, airports, uh, it's quite broad. Uh, I have total confidence that branded search will be a big part of the future search behavior, and I'm happy to ride the wave as a pioneer. Thank you.